Good evening and welcome to the fourth annual Bio El Paso Juarez Summit, MedTech Manufacturing on the U.S.-Mexico border, building a resilient binational industry. My name is Emma Schwartz and I'm the CEO of Bio El Paso Juarez. I want to start off our event by thanking our event title sponsor, RexMed. You've been a great supporter and participant in BioEPJ for a long time. We really appreciate your commitment. Um, this event kicks off a full agenda today and tomorrow dedicated to the medtech industry in El Paso and Juarez, which has proven to be an essential part of the global supply chain for medical devices and a hub for US bound medical device production. Bio El Paso Juarez was launched exactly three years ago. And in the last three years, our organization has been dedicated to supporting the region's medical device manufacturing industry. Our mission is to drive innovation, collaboration, growth, and resilience in the regional medical device sector by bringing together medical, industrial, academic, governmental, and entrepreneurial leadership. To help us kick off our summit, we are thrilled to welcome our keynote speaker, Ryan Pierce, who will talk to us about resetting the stage for medtech innovation. Ryan Pierce is a venture partner at SV Health Investors MedTech Convergence Fund, co-founder and CEO of Nine, and a lecturer in bioengineering at Stanford University, where he teaches Bio E70Q, medical device innovation, and he sits on the faculty of Stanford Biodesign. In earlier roles, Ryan has served as B VP of Design and Innovation at Ventus Medical, VP of Business Development at Loma Vista Medical, a healthcare investor at DeNovo Ventures and Rock Health, and a product designer at Concentric Medical and the foundry Zephyr Medical. An inventor on over 30 issued US patents, Ryan has designed FDA cleared devices to treat sleep apnea and stroke. He earned a BS in mechanical engineering from MIT and an MS in mechanical engineering from Stanford and an MBA from Harvard Business School. We are really honored to have Ryan with us today. Ryan, please take it away. Emma, thank you so much for having me. It's a real uh, pleasure to be with you, uh, if only virtually. Um, and thanks for your honor of, of speaking uh, to the group gathered. Um, in preparing for this, I was thinking back a little bit about um, you know, innovation and where it comes from, how it happens. And we decided to talk about the, the topic of how do you set or reset the stage uh, for medtech innovation. And I think our field is unique in that uh, it's just fundamentally audacious. Um, when I'm at a social event and people ask what I do, I feel like they, they probably are either somewhat impressed or just think I'm crazy and, and both could be right. Um, but that audacity of medtech innovation uh, is a theme that we are forced to think about a lot. It's a fundamentally audacious thing to think that we can uh, devise diagnostics or treatments for diseases that have existed as long as as long as humans are. So I want to talk about uh, themes that are related to audacity and hopefully useful. Um, one is rapid democratization and decentralization of medtech innovation and what that means for those of us trying to do audacious things. And then talk a little bit about how do you set your own stage to innovate. And there are four themes under that first category uh, that we're going to go through capital, the toolbox, the backlog, and what I will call re-regulation that I think as categories are conspiring to make this the best time ever uh, and in a way the easiest time ever to creating new healthcare innovations. So let's talk about capital. Uh, the, the head capital right now is that uh, there's more of it than there has ever been uh, to innovate in healthcare. You'll see these numbers from Silicon Valley Bank. It just keeps rising and that number on the far right is only through the first half of 2021. And this influx of capital has a number of ramifications for those of us who are creating new medical technologies. Number one, money has to find somewhere new to go, new places, new people, new markets. And if there's more money, that means more cap, more favorable terms for investors, or I'm sorry, for, for founders, just as a matter of supply and demand. Uh, what we're seeing a lot of here in Silicon Valley are that tech investors uh, are entering healthcare investing. They're testing old assumptions about disruption, about the age of founders, about what founder backgrounds are supposed to be, and what deal structures can look like. And so it's keeping those who have traditionally invested in, in medical technology on their toes because the rules are being reset whether they like them or not. We're seeing along with that a deinstitutionalization of investment by angels, by accelerators, 
You could even put SPACs in that category. Again, the rules are getting changed, the rules are getting broken. Um, and that's an opportunity for those, especially those who have been in those places, in those professions, who have been interested in those markets that have traditionally been ignored. They have an opportunity now that the rules are falling apart uh, to participate in ways that they couldn't or didn't have the opportunity to before. As those atypical innovators succeed, they're gonna become more typical. Finally, early stage money is going further than before, and that's gonna lead us into our next category, which I'm gonna call the toolbox. Basically, technology and open education are making it easier to do early stage innovation cheaper and faster than ever. When I started my career, uh, most of the things that we built required injection molding, required uh, complicated machining, you know, all kinds of complicated processes. Uh, it was very expensive to start a medical device company back then, and a lot has changed in the meantime. The way that we research, um, we can go on PubMed and benefit from you know, unfortunate grad students who spent years discovering fundamental things that our discoveries rely on. It's easier to find information than it's ever been. Early in my career, we would pay $200 a month for IP monitoring services. I remember writing a guest piece for a medical device publication about this brand new search in Google that helped us identify vendors and so forth. Um, it sounds quaint now and kind of funny, but uh, in reality, it wasn't actually a big step forward at that time because it was so hard to find information. You basically waited for those twice a year um, uh, vendor events where you can meet the people uh, who could see, sell you the parts and so forth. We can get consumer insights much more easily now through online tools. So that research that underlies the creation of a new medical technology in the first place is just so much easier and so much cheaper. We can build things faster. We can build things uh, more easily, much more cheaply. You think about the 3D printing and just the advent of digital health Again, that shifts the power from those with capital, which those of us who innovate had only, always had to de depend on just as a, as a ticket to play, uh, as, as those tools to build have become much cheaper, the power shifts to the innovator from the traditional power holders, the traditional institutions, the traditional investors. And finally, just navigating the system, the tricks of the trade. You know, I think earlier in my career where the Code of Federal Regulations was in a leather-bound notebook uh, or in leather-bound books on a shelf. You really had to know exactly who to call FDA, how that all works. And navigating that system has become much, much easier. FDA has done a better job of putting how their system works online. Um, and I think there have been educational initiatives um, that have really helped, such as the Biodesign Program at Stanford. I want to talk a little bit about the backlog. And so the idea here is that when markets, geographies, and talent pools are overlooked, they actually accumulate potential. And we're seeing that in a number of ways. Number one, there's been a lot more emphasis on uh, fields within medicine that have been ignored, such as femtech. Uh, we're seeing deliberate mandates from limited partners of venture funds to put money into those categories, to uh, encourage, to support uh, entrepreneurs who are in typically underrepresented categories. Um, and there's this latent backlog of opportunity, of talent, and of ideas um, that I'm hoping that we'll continue to see arrive and really change the look of health tech. Um, with remote work, with the pandemic, that's causing us to revisit assumptions about where innovation has to take place. If it doesn't have to be in the office, it can be at home. Well, why does that home have to be in San Francisco? Why does it have to be in Boston? It's really opening the door to what we've all suspected is true, is that, which is that innovation can happen anywhere. Another, another variable I'm very interested in is just whether or not young entrepreneurs are welcome in an industry. And I think tech, uh, the, the tech community's interest in healthcare has helped. And I think programs, again, like Stanford Biodesign, which takes typically fairly early career fellows, puts them through an intense program um, and creates all these examples, 53 to date, of companies being founded, um, 4.3 million patients impacted to date. It's causing us to revisit assumptions about uh, the people, the places, the categories uh, that are hosting innovation. Finally, I wanna talk about this category I'll call re-regulation. Re, 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 re and that's basically the idea that the gatekeeping in healthcare is becoming more rational, it's becoming more nuanced, and ultimately it's losing power. I wanna look at a few examples. Let's look at market approval. 
during COVID, we've had a strong precedent from emergency use authorizations um, that fortunately have gotten life-saving vaccines and life-saving drugs onto, uh, onto the market much faster. Um, but I think we're going to continue to wonder, well, if we can do it that quickly when we really, really have to, um, can we do it much more quickly going forward? Uh, if you look at FDA guidance on devices versus mobile apps, traditionally we've been indicating careful when we create medical technologies. With mobile apps, there's a lot more flexibility. On a device, if I want to treat obesity, I have to say exactly what that's doing. I have to make a very specific claim. On mobile apps, I can say a device to encourage healthy eating. If you think about that, it's softening the edges of regulation and allowing useful tools to get out into the world much faster. This starts to raise the question of, you know, is there an opportunity for FDA guidance, for FDA indications for use um, to accelerate the introduction of new technologies? Finally, I think to give credit, credit is new FDA is just getting better. Review times have gotten better. Um, the processes have become more efficient. Um, and that only helps those of us who face upfront investments in of time and resources in navigating all of this. On payment and reimbursement, um, I am hoping that uh, as reimbursement becomes faster, um, perhaps more predictable, that that will shift power to early stage innovators. And here's why. When you start a company with an innovation, there are all these stages of de-risking that are ahead of you. And if that's far ahead of you, after you've done your fundamental part of creating the innovation, there's still so much risk that that leaves power with those who have the capital to, to, to de-risk that, if that makes sense. And I like an opportunity to work in a field where I can embrace more technical risk, more clinical risk up front, which allows us to go after bigger problems because we have to worry less about the system downstream. There's another factor in here, which is the, in, the increasing role of self-insured employers. Rational self-insured employers won't wait for tools uh, that fall under the lighter mobile app guidance from FDA, but will make their, their covered population, <coughs> their covered population, their employees healthier. Again, that's going to set new expectations for how the more traditional payers operate and at what speed. Finally, I think we revisit this question of what does it mean to have licensure to practice medicine? So I'll take an example. Let's look at telehealth. If telehealth can take a single doctor and, and allow them to visit with far more patients per day, the friction of local licensure diminishes. And why that matters is that traditionally in med tech, we have to go to a lot of physicians typically to get buy-in physician by physician by physician. The cost gets very high to reach patients. And again, that shifts risk. Uh, risk reduction and execution toward the, the tail end of the introduction of new medical technologies, which disempowers those of us who are working at the front end coming up with those innovations. So I like the idea that downstream processes get much smoother. Similarly, we can ask the question, can the spirit of licensing, what is it that when we license a physician, license a nurse, what is it that we want them to do? Can some of that be captured by algorithms? Again, making the whole system more efficient and letting us shift resources toward fundamental discovery and fundamental innovation. A few final thoughts. I want to talk about setting your own stage. And much of this is autobiographical uh, as an innovator. And some of it um, is based, as much of it is based on doing it wrong and as doing it the right way. So number one, I would encourage you to fall in love with a problem. Um, it doesn't have to be love at first sight. Um, but it turns out that if you're in love with a problem, you'll think about it a lot more. You'll enjoy reading all the articles on PubMed. Um, that will be a competitive advantage for you that you are so devoted to a problem. And in a way, I think devotion to a problem is far more important than raw intelligence or pedigree or anything else. So it's a, it's a competitive advantage that is really in your control. Second, gain risk capacity. I'm surprised how many um, would-be entrepreneurs I talk to who say they need to raise $50,000 for their startup, but they drive a $40,000 car, just to be very specific. Um, look at your life and ask, how can I create risk capacity to try to do big things? Third, invest early in the tools and processes for productivity and sanity. Um, I think if you're especially running a, a, uh, uh, a lean startup, um, it's just not as exciting to pay for the software that helps you organize your day, but do that early so you can enjoy the benefits from the beginning. 
And again, there's a reason I put productivity and sanity there. Uh, innovating, doing early stage startups can drive you crazy. Um, so invest in protecting your, your emotional health um, and surround yourself with people uh, who can give you honest feedback. Spend more time with stakeholders, less time on PR. Uh, when you're trying to do something audacious, um, Anyone coming along wanting to write an article about your startup, there's something very affirming. You think, oh, I must be doing something that makes sense since TechCrunch wants to start uh, write an article about it. Um, but the truth is, uh, all those moments, TechCrunch is not your customer. Uh, all those moments are best spent with the people who will provide feedback that will help you understand product market fit. And then finally, uh, learn when to accommodate your weaknesses rather than overcome them. This is something I've had to learn the hard way, is that you're ultimately not going to be good at everything that your startup does. Um, and there's an idea kind of perhaps from the self-improvement world that we can, we, can, we can overcome those weaknesses. We can become strong in the things we're weak at. That's probably true for a few categories, but on a practical level, um, put people around you, put resources around you that accommodate your weaknesses so you can focus on what you're good at. Uh, finally, I just want to say this is the best time ever to be building innovations in healthcare. Um, I think uh, that is becoming increasingly true no matter where you're located, no matter what your professional background is. And in fact, those things can become your competitive advantages. And, uh, and that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Emma. That's great advice, Ryan. And, and we are really living in unprecedented times. I think the disruption of COVID is really exciting for, for innovators and, and for the med tech space. And I think it's going to be really fun to see what comes out and the speed with which it comes out. Uh, a whole new set of doors opening up and, and it's going to spur a lot of innovation. So thanks for that great advice. Thank you.